Good morning, everyone. This is July 25th, 10 o'clock East Coast time. And I want to thank all of you for attending our second Romeca Corporation webinar. I'm happy to say that we have guests uh, attending today from all over the United States, as well as uh, in countries as far away as India, Mexico, Poland, Italy, Canada, Egypt, and Australia. So thanks everyone for uh, tuning in. Uh, our plan is to make the next 60 minutes valuable to you. Uh, as you know, we are going to focus on utilization of the Romeca Corporation conveyor power design software. So without further ado, let's begin. I know that some registrants are still signing in, but if anyone is uh, coming in a few minutes late, they can certainly listen to the recording that we'll post not long after the webinar concludes. Once again, thanks for attending. This is our second in the series of webinars. In the next 60 minutes, we're going to uh, go through this material, leaving 10 or 15 minutes at the end for questions from you all. Uh, since we're in webinar mode in this software, uh, you're, you are not able to speak uh, to the presenter. However, you can communicate any questions or comments by simply typing in the questions section of your dialog box on the GoToWebinar uh, dialog box that came with this software. So feel free to use that anytime during the presentation. I'll be doing most of the talking on behalf of Romeca Corporation, but I have three additional colleagues listening in. Uh, two of whom can uh, compile the questions and make sure we address them at the end. I'll be focusing on talking. Steve Forbes and Zach Lehman will be focusing on uh, prioritizing your questions so that we can handle them in a professional way. So without further ado, let's begin. In the next hour, we're going to give you an introduction to Romeca Group. We'll introduce you to Romeca Corporation's tutorial video library to show you that resource that's available for your use. We will introduce you to Romeca Corporation's belt conveyor power calculation software. We call it Design Imperial version 7.30. And it is based on what is called the SEMA historical nomenclature or the SEMA historical methodology in calculating required power and tension. Uh, I'm happy to tell you the program uh, I wrote it over 25 years ago, and it's been used successfully all this time, reliably. Our international group is developing a new program to use the historical, uh, rather than historical, to use the SEMA universal method. So that's in process. Uh, nonetheless, we will go through this historical methodology and nomenclature to help you um, design uh, conveyors efficiently. In addition to showing you the conveyor design guidelines, we're going to give you designing and optimizing uh, tips uh, on such things as uh, hopper feeder considerations, dual drive considerations, in addition to showing you how to use the program on standard conveyor parameters. An introduction, an introduction to our company. Uh, we are a major supplier of rollers, motorized pulleys, pulleys and components for the global materials handling market. As you can see in this slide, we are located in more than 20 countries all over the world. Our headquarters is in Northern Italy, and we have approximately 1,200 employees scattered around the world with a consolidated group turnover of about $200 million, and we're a privately owned group. Romeca Corporation, who is sponsoring this webinar, is located in Wilmington, North Carolina. This is our new facility, new as of last year in August. We have 11 folks all together here. Uh, we are a major supplier of motorized pulleys for the US materials handling industry. And we have five engineers on staff. And just for grins this morning, I counted up our total combined years of experience in conveyor design technology. And we have over hundred years of experience considering the five of us on staff. This is the center of excellence of motorized pulley production for Romeca Group. It's picture of the Romeca Germany plant. And as you can see 
from that plant, we supply rollers, motorized pulleys, pulleys and components for the global materials handling market. And we've been doing that since the early 1950s. The plant is located in Aschersleben, Germany. We have over 200 employees and the facility is nearly 700,000 square feet. Now, the next two slides address our video tutorial library. We encourage all of you participants, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We've been methodically posting useful tips, two minutes, four minutes, 10 minutes, on how to um, improve conveyors, how to design conveyors, and so forth. Some of the posts have been up for nearly a year. Some of them have been viewed by over 9,500 people. And uh, we continue to have uh, visitors look at these videos on a daily basis. We're, we put them there uh, for your use. In addition to the YouTube channel, you can avail yourself of these videos by going to our website and going to the how-to video gallery. The same uh, videos are there. We have topics such as how to calculate belt tensions, how to calculate belt pull and belt power for moving boxes, how to uh, optimize a conveyor feeder design, how to calculate drag for belt cleaners and things of that nature, how to change oil and motorized pulleys and so forth. We intend to keep adding videos as time permits. Now uh, to pay attention to the most important topic of this webinar, which is the uh, Design Imperial Program version 7.30. Uh, this is what the input screen looks like. Uh, it consists of an Excel workbook with multiple work worksheets, uh, which I'll demonstrate in a minute. But this is the main page. This is where you would input most of your design parameters, and this is where the most important results will be displayed. It will enable you, as you use it, to calculate belt pull, which we call TE, and calculate power. And by the way, we're using imperial units throughout uh, the next hour. It's also going to enable you to select the pulley model, uh, check special loading conditions, check the pulley diameter, check the radial load, check belt strength. You can see the items listed here. We'll be demonstrating how to calculate, how to uh, plot trajectories in material cross section and how to optimize belt speed versus belt width decisions. And at the very end, we'll demonstrate the dual drive uh, capabilities and the hopper pressure relief capabilities as well. On the top there, you can see the link to the page in our website where you can download this software if you haven't already done so. Now to address SEMA conveyor nomenclature using the historical methods. First, we define conveyor length. And that's defined as the distance between the tail pulley and the head pulley. We also define the tonnage rate. In this example, continuous flow of material from the feed chute into the discharge chute measured in so many tons per hour. Belt speed specified in feet per minute. Additional terms that need to be identified is material lift height. Material lift height is defined as that distance from the tail pulley, top of the tail pulley to the top of the head pulley. We also need to define minimum and maximum ambient temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. We need to uh, specify initial velocity if relevant. In fact, in most cases, since the angle of material falling on the belt is so steep, Using trigonometry, the component of velocity which is parallel to the surface of the belt is so small as to be negligible. So we almost always leave this zero. However, if you're using it for a speed up conveyor or something like that, where the initial velocity would be significant, it's there for your use. We also define belt cleaners as scrapers that are typically on the face of the discharge pulley and scrapers, return belt scrapers, which are on the top of the return screen, usually to prevent rocks from lodging between the tail pulley and the belt. Skirt length, we also need to define that. And that is defined as the distance from where the material first falls on the takeaway conveyor to the exit of the skirt zone. We also need to define material depth in the skirt zone. This is specified in inches. And you would simply put in the depth of material that you anticipate material to be within the skirt board itself. This of course is essential because if the skirt board is long, the amount of drag of material rubbing against the steel skirt board can be significant. 
So we not only need to specify the length of the zone, but also the width of the zone or the height of the zone. And we also need, of course, to mention the frictional coefficient of material. We'll get to that in a minute. We need to define the number of non-driven pulleys. And in the case of a conveyor with a counterweighted take up, as you can see on the left, we would have four non-driven pulleys, two snubs, one in the vertical gravity take up position and one at the tail. In the example on the right, which shows a mechanical type of take up, you would have one non-driven pulley as illustrated here. Other parameters that are important to define would be the elevation above sea level. That's because it's more difficult to cool a motor uh, at 5,000 feet than it is at uh, zero feet above sea level. We'll demonstrate that in a minute. As I mentioned before, we need to specify the frictional coefficient of the material, the bulk density expressed in pounds per cubic foot. Size consist, this term may not be familiar to everyone, but that simply is a way of specifying the percentage of fines and the percentage of lumps in the material that's going to be handled. Maximum lump size in inches needs to be defined. Now, as you look at this cross section, you can see some key uh, SEMA nomenclature that we're going to be referring to later in some detail. I want to point out a very important uh, dimension, which is dimension C or edge distance. SEMA specifies edge distance so as to make sure that the designer of the conveyor is not going to have the belt too full too full meaning it would have a high probability of having material jump off the edges. So SEMA edge distance is always recommended. And that edge distance is calculated and it is a function of material surcharge angle, which you can see defined as alpha, angle alpha here, material surcharge, as it rests within the trough. The angle of the trough itself, which is beta, the width of the belt, and of course bulk density tons per hour, feet per minute, all are going to combine into uh, calculating this particular uh, cross-section of material. Belt wrap, the angle of belt wrap needs to be specified uh, in degrees. On the left, you can see an example of 180 degrees of belt wrap. This is a single drive application at a quarry in the UK. We only have material wrapping around the face of the discharge pulley in this instance. The example on the right is a dual drive uh, example. This is a discharge conveyor on a bucket wheel machine. And let me show the way in which this discharge conveyor belt moves. The material is carried from left to right. And of course, the drives are in a nested dual arrangement on the return. So the return strand comes back in this direction wraps around the lower pulley, wraps around the upper pulley, and then back to the tail pulley, as you can see here. In this example, we have 420 degrees of belt wrap with very significant, with a very positive, significant impact on the belt life and belt tension. We also need to specify the type of lagging. And when we say type of lagging, in our terminology, we mean, is it going to be full, as you can see illustrated here? Is it going to be unlagged, as you can see illustrated here? Or will it have partial lagging, as you can see illustrated here? This has an impact on the type of uh, T2 slack side tension you need to calculate to prevent slippage. You also need to specify the type of take up. We referred to this earlier. On the upper illustration, you see a gravity type take up in which usually a pulley has a, a weight hanging on it, typically concrete, to provide automatic uh, slack side tension or mechanical. So automatic or me mechanical or automatic and manual are the two choices. When we need to specify type of belt, we're referring to the number of plies. It's also important to specify drive location. Here's an example of pulley drive at the head here for a horizontal or inclined conveyor. Here's an example of a pulley drive at the tail on an elevating or horizontal example. All the examples on the right are examples of lowering, lowering or decline conveyors.
It's also important to indicate the condition of idlers and pulleys. In other words, are they well maintained or do they need maintenance? And last but not least, uh, it, will you have a dual drive, yes or no? Now, we're not going to define these parameters in any detail. I'm going to ask you to take it on faith that these parameters work. Uh, this equation has been uh, programmed, as I said, for over 25 years, and it's working effectively. These parameters enable the user of the program to calculate effective tension, which we call TE and is expressed in pound. The first collection of parameters enable you to calculate the belt tension required to overcome friction, friction. And friction could be uh, the friction due to bearing uh, friction in the pulleys. It could be bearing, it could be uh, friction due to accessories such as belt cleaners and skirt seals and that sort of a thing. These components enable the user to calculate the belt tension required to overcome gravity in the case of an elevating conveyor. And last but not least, TAM is the, is the parameter which defines momentum. In other words, how, belt, how much belt tension do you need to accelerate material from the initial velocity as it hits the belt to the terminal velocity, which is defined as the belt speed. Your answer to this equation automatically comes out as effective tension in pounds. To calculate required power, it's simply a matter of multiplying the required belt tension in pounds by the belt speed, TE times V. The answer will come out in so many foot pounds per minute. And once again, in imperial units, since we know that one horsepower equals 33,000 foot pounds per minute, it's a simple matter of dividing TE times V by 33,000 to have the answer come out in horsepower. So TE in pounds times V in feet per minute divided by 33,000 foot-pounds per minute per horsepower yields an answer in horsepower. Now, how do we use the program to design a bulk conveyor drive? Well, given the plant production requirements, such as required handling rate in tons per hour, and the geometry, for example, the length of the conveyor and ambient site conditions, such as its elevation or its temperature, we need to select a belt width, then select a belt speed. Conversely, you can, exp you can select a belt speed and then select a belt width. It's important to optimize those two parameters. Once you've done that, you'll calculate TE, effective tension in pounds, derive your power required, then you'll select a drive then if necessary, you reiterate to optimize. This is an example of a small elevating conveyor at a recycling facility in Florida. Now, uh, as I'll demonstrate in a minute, the answers page, the parameter page in the software is going to show not only the brake horsepower or the calculated power to drive the conveyor belt, what, what and it's based on the tension required to overcome friction, et cetera. But we also put in a variety of derating factors. For example, we need to derate to overcome drive pulley bearing friction. We need to derate for the transmission loss. We do that automatically, as you can see pictured on the right. Derate for high elevation, derate for high temperature, and derate, if necessary, for conditions of pulleys and idlers. Now, we prefer to keep the setting, as you'll see in a minute, on well-maintained, meaning you're going to get an answer based on the pure SEMA uh, methodology, assuming that everything is brand new. You can also select need maintenance, and it's going to put a D-rate factor in. We don't recommend that because we recommend that you use the SEMA idea, meaning what is the requirement of a pristine conveyor, then you as the designer can make a decision. Well, this conveyor is going to get severe wear, perhaps it's going to be poorly maintained, therefore I will put my own personal factor on. For example, if my answer comes out to be 42 horsepower, maybe I'll put in a 50. Or if it comes out to 42 horsepower and I know it's going to be beat up and not maintained, maybe I'll put in a 60. But the designer should, in our opinion, uh, take that responsibility. So listed here are the various D rates, and you'll see that uh, displayed later in our example. Now let's turn our attention to an example. This is a simple example. We'll calculate required power and effective tension 
and we're going to check them and check what's called the SEMA fill factor. It's a simple elevating conveyor with standard loading conditions and continuous material flow. What I'm going to do now is open up the program for you in its default condition. In other words, when you open it up, the parameters have already been programmed in, and of course you need to change them to meet your own uh, conditions. So in this example, we're going to say that the conveyor is 80 feet long. It's going to be handling 500 tons per hour. The desired belt speed is 300 feet per minute. And we know that is an elevating conveyor. It's 80 feet long. And this uh, feature is here for your convenience. When you activate it, it enables you to avoid having to do trigonometry. So if we know we have an 18 degree incline on an 80 foot conveyor, it does the calculation for us. And it tells us that we need to input 24.7 feet as the amount of um, elevation from the tail pulley to the head pulley. We'll leave in the ambient conditions of minus 10 and plus 100. We're going to leave in the uh, default of one belt cleaner. We'll also leave in the default setting of 12 foot of skirt with three inches of material in depth. And we'll leave as one non-driven pulley. Let me also explain some of the other parameters here. Here is where we would specify the elevation above sea level. So let's assume that this uh, project, in fact, it actually is in North Carolina. So 3,300 feet above sea level or below, meaning no D-rate for elevation would apply. If we were in Denver, we would select 5,000 feet above sea level. If we were in Mexico City, we would select 7,000 feet above sea level. If we were in one of the copper mines in Peru, we would select 10,000 feet above sea level to have the proper D-rate in. But let's set it back to 3,300. These next three choices allow you to select the material. The default is on limestone, and we're specifying in this example a frictional coefficient of 0.128. Other choices, let me show you quickly, would be, for example, iron ore. Iron ore has the highest frictional coefficient of any of the materials in the program. Uh, we'll go back to limestone. This selection limestone is showing that the bulk density is specified as 90 pounds per cubic foot. Next, the size, consist, the size consist selection allows us to pick mostly lumps, mostly fines, or 50-50. In this camp, in this example, we're going to leave it on mostly fines, 90% fines, 10%, 90% uh, lumps, 10% fines. So it's mostly lumps. And our lump size, we're going to leave at two inches, which is the default setting. Material surcharge angle, as I said, needs to be specced. And if you're ever in doubt as to what number to use, we have a little cheat sheet built in. If I can activate it here. Work with me. Material surcharge angle you can find here. So for a given angle of repose, for example, for um, Typical common materials such as stone, uh, you'd have an angle of repose of 35 to 39 degrees and a surcharge angle of 25. So we're going to leave the program on the default setting of 25 degrees. We'll also, for this example, start out by showing you we'll leave the belt width at the default of 36 inches, assuming that we'll have a belt with a fabric carcass, SEMA five inch diameter idle rollers would be used, SEMA selection C, tells uh, the type of bearings to uh, calculate into the frictional coefficients. We're going to use an idler spacing for the choppers of four feet. We're going to select 180 degrees of belt wrap, fully lagged. And of course, we can't use an automatic take up because it will be most sensible to have a manual type take up, a screw take up, usually at the tail on such a small conveyor. And let's try a two-ply belt. These are your choices available. We're going to try a two-ply belt. Uh, we'll put the drive at the head. And of course, as I said previously, we will assume that this conveyor is reasonably well maintained. And of course, there'll be no dual drive in this example. So what is our answer? Our answer comes out to be 19.3 horsepower with an effective belt tension, TE, of 1,957 pounds, horsepower of 19.3, and a belt pull of just under one ton. Now let's take a look 
at one of the worksheets in this workbook, notice that we have a specifier page on the bottom here, a model selector page, a trajectory page, two cross-section pages, design parameter page, terminology page, lift height page, which I demonstrated earlier to you, and a startup page. Let's take a quick look at the cross-section page to see what the situation is. Ah, well, as you can see here, 500 tons per hour at 300 feet per minute on a 36 inch wide conveyor belt only has the belt 58% full, as you can see. SEMA recommends a standard edge distance of 2.9 inches, but for our given parameters, we have an edge distance of six inches. Clearly, we can optimize this. So let's have a look at changing the parameter from 36 inches to 30 inches. Now we've just decreased the belt width. Let's see the impact on cross section. Ah, now you can see that we are at 86% full. Let's zoom in a little bit here. You can see that we're 86% full. SEMA recommends 2.6 inches on the edge. We have 3.3, doesn't look so bad. And notice that it had a neg negligible impact on the horsepower and very negligible impact on the effect of belt tension. So what did we learn in that quick uh, trial of the program? Well, we calculated uh, an 80 foot long conveyor with about 25 foot of elevation carrying 500 tons per hour at 300 feet per minute. We need 18.8 horsepower. We have an effective tension of 1,908 pounds. And we noticed that uh, it would be prudent to probably use a 36 inch wide belt uh, to get the best value for the dollar and have it be 86% of the SEMA recommended fill factor. Now I would like to turn our attention to some additional tips on designing a bulk conveyor drive. That was just a quick exposure to the program now, these are some steps that you would need to go through to select your belt width, belt size, and so forth. Step number one, for a given material conveying rate, as in the example we just did, Q equals 500 tons per hour. So for a given rate of Q, we want to, and a given bulk density, for we have to have a belt speed and a belt width that produces a, a fill factor somewhere uh, with the material near the standard edge distance. Note also that the belt width should be equal to or greater than three times the maximum lump size for 20 degree surcharge material and greater than or equal six times the maximum lump size for a 30 degree surcharge angle. This chart was extracted from the uh, SEMA conveyor design manual to show you uh, how these things are uh, to show you recommend, recommendations from SEMA. So in the case of coarse crushed stone, SEMA is recommending a belt speed of in the range of 350 feet per minute uh, for belt widths uh, in the range of 18 inches. And for faster belt speeds, uh, 500 feet per minute would, would correspond to belt widths of 24 inches to 36 inches and so forth. And that belt width that you select must be wide enough to prevent the loading chute and the skirt board from jamming. So in other words, the, uh, the loading chute and the skirt board should be wide enough uh, three, three to five times the maximum lump size. So if it's a six inch lump, you would need to have it be somewhere from 18 to 30 inches between uh, the skirt boards. Selecting the belt speed is similar. We're going to optimize that. We're going to optimize the belt speed and the belt width. And for dusty conditions, we're going to make sure that we select the speed to minimize fugitive dust emissions. You don't want it to be so fast the dust is going everywhere. So that's a consideration. Also, you don't want the speed to be so fast for heavy sharp material uh, that you would be uh, wearing out your chute liner or your belt prematurely. 
Now, this nomogram was extracted once again from the third edition of the SEMA conveyor design manual, and I would like to explain it to you briefly. It shows that minimum belt width is a function of surcharge angle, lump size, and size consist. So for just using as an example, a 25 degree surcharge and a six inch lump size, we would need to look at our material and decide, is it all lumps? Is it 90% fines and 10% lumps? Or is it 10% fines and 90% lumps? On this graph, you will see on the vertical axis, lump size from small to high, from low to high, from lower to higher, we go smaller to larger, and on the horizontal axis, belt width. What I've highlighted in red for you is the are the lines that would correspond to a 25 degree surcharge angle. The upper line here corresponds to 10% lumps and 90% fines for 25 degree surcharge. And this lower line corresponds to all lumps. So notice in our example for a six inch lump size and a 25 degree surcharge, the recommendation is from 24 inch wide belt to a 36 inch wide belt or 40 inch wide belt, if there was such a thing. And notice intuitively that for a given surcharge angle, the larger the lump size and the higher the percentage of lumps, the wider the belt must be to prevent the lumps from dropping off the conveyor. That's the whole point of this nomogram. And uh, back in the day when the third edition was published, uh, nomograms were in use, but we have in fact uh, turned this nomogram into equations so that the program is going to calculate your requirements with this rendered um, as equations. So what are the steps we need to take as we move on in our conveyor drive design? We need to select a motor transmission to match the design speed and to provide equal to or more than enough power, minimizing the drive, different drives if necessary. We're gonna optimize effective tension and required power using a fixed belt width and different speed if available or the contrary or the opposite. We're gonna check the cross section ensuring that the edge distance is acceptable. And we're gonna check the material trajectory, ensuring that the transfer chute will not plug and material will drop at the desired location. And I just this minute remembered that I forgot to show you something on the previous demo, I apologize for that. So bear with me for a minute here while we go back to that simple elevating conveyor that 80 foot long elevating conveyor. I forgot to show that the program displays parameters. These are the SEMA historical parameters, all of which need to be calculated in order to give the answer, in this case, 18.8 horsepower. All these parameters are here for any of you engineers that like to know what the contribution of one particular factor may be in determining power. Like for example, how much is my belt cleaner drag? Another thing that I neglected to present to you previously was the trajectory feature. So here's the trajectory as the default setting uh, is displayed. What you're seeing in red is that 300 feet per minute we selected earlier at alternative speed uh, colored in blue. Also, you're looking at a dark vertical line, which is intended to represent the chute wall for given diameter of pulley. Well, we need to adjust this to make it correspond to what we just looked at. And if you recall, we had an angle of inclination of 18 degrees. So I need to put in 18 degrees so that the tra trajectory will be displayed correctly. An 18 degree inclination would have a trajectory that looks like this. The lines are actually depicting the center of mass of material. And it's advisable, I want to point out to you here, that it's advisable that you always have the center of mass impacting a vertical wall if there is one below the horizontal center line that intersects the, the shaft of the pulley. So let me demonstrate what that means. If we were to have a chute, which is 15 inches from the center of rotation of the pulley, as you can see here, 15 inches, this would be a horrible situation because the trajectory clearly would be impacting that wall above the horizontal, horizontal center line. This chute would be problem prone because it would be plugging constantly. 
it would be advisable to have a chute if there was one in the range of 24 inches from the horizontal center line of the pulley. This a blue color allows you to experiment with other belt speeds as you do your optimization. So notice that if we put in 400 feet per minute, it plots a different trajectory. That would be faster than the target that we picked earlier of 300 feet per minute. We can also quickly look at what 200 feet per minute looks like. So this plotting software allows you to see the trajectory of the material for for the case that you're working on. You can also change the diameter of the pulley. You can also uh, change the lagging thickness. Why would you do such a thing? Well, lagging thickness and diameter of pulley, of course, are going to influence the, the tangent point where the trajectory takes off. So I'm sorry I forgot to mention that previously. Let's get back to our PowerPoint presentation. So now as we look at the few last things we need to consider, we need to select a conveyor drive. We need to check the radial load and the radial load uh, can be problematic if you do not have a pulley size to withstand it. And radial load looks like this. Radial load is that force which is equal and opposite to the belt tensions that you apply. For example, here's T1, which is TE plus T2, effective tension plus slack side tension. Here's slack side tension. This is actually intended to be the vector sum of those two forces. So the radial load is the equal and opposite force needed to withstand the belt tensions. We want to make sure that we check slack side tension, also called T2 to, resi to resist slip. Here's a little example of slippage of a belt on a pulley. You can notice that the belt is not nearly keeping up with the RPM of the pulley in this instance. Not a good situation. The slack side tension should be higher. Another slack side tension that is necessary to calculate is the one required to resist sag. Here's an example of the belt with terrible sag. SEMA has three percentages of sag which are recommended for given parameters as you put them in. It's, it's one, one percent excuse me, 1.5%, 2%, or 3%, depending upon a variety of input uh, parameters. And then SEMA will uh, specify the amount of slack side tension required to keep the belt in that, uh, in that range of appropriate sag. Here, this belt probably loses material constantly. Then it's necessary to check total tension. As I mentioned previously, total tension, T1, is the sum of effective tension plus slack side tension. And by the way, this is a subject of a complete video that we produced a month ago. Then you need to check belt strength, you need to check pulley diameter. And now this gives us the opportunity to have a quick look at a more uh, rigorous uh, application of our program. In fact, um, excuse me for uh, interrupting myself, but this is an actual case of a thousand foot long elevating conveyor. We want to calculate and optimize horsepower and effective tension and total tension in this particular example. So I will open it and I've preloaded the parameters to save time. We know um, that in this instance, the customer had a thousand foot long conveyor he wanted to handle 1,000 tons per hour. And he initially approached us with a belt speed of 400 feet per minute. And he initially approached us requesting a single drive. So 1,000 foot long conveyor, 1,000 tons per hour, 400 feet per minute, this was the request from the customer with a lift height of 200 feet and the other parameters as you can see here, four non-driven pulleys, limestone, uh, 42 inch wide belt width, etc. cetera, four ply belt and so forth. So I just want to show that these parameters have a belt power requirement, a drive power requirement of 257 horsepower and a TE of 20,000 
313 pounds. Now let's take a look at our model selector page. I want to draw your attention to the model selector page and it's designed to allow the user to select an appropriate motorized pulley. In this case, I preloaded it to our, our second from our largest one with a radial load capability of 40,500 pounds. You'll notice that the radial load in this instance, single drive, 400 feet per minute is 40,626 pounds. It's an incredible load. Note also that T1 is 30,470 pounds. In this case, our four ply belt is, uh, I've selected a four ply belt and uh, sadly lacking in being able to withstand the force required in this particular uh, set of uh, design parameters. And I wanna carefully draw your attention to T2 to required belt slippage is 10,157 pounds. Effective tension is shown here. T2 to resist slip is here. T2 to resist sag is here. T1 is added for you right here, 30,470 pounds. Let me show you the impact of speeding the belt up. If we speed the belt up to 600, feet per minute, our required power goes from 257 horsepower to about 269 horsepower. And notice that the TE dropped dramatically down to 14,161 pounds. Note also that our radial load has dropped dramatically to below 30,000 pounds. Note also that our T2 that's required to resist the slippage drop from over 10,000 to about 7,000 pounds. And notice that our total tension is now 21,241 pounds. The third step in this demonstration is finally the dual drive. I know I'm going through this quickly, but uh, you can always watch the recording uh, at your leisure. So now I'm going to select an angle of wrap in 300, of 360 degrees and select a dual drive, you notice that the horsepower requirement has not changed. The impact on TE is insignificant, but take a look at this. Our T2, which is required to prevent pulley slippage, belt and pulley slippage, dropped from over 10,000 pounds to below 2,000 pounds. In fact, it's dropped so low that the slack side tension that governs is now T2 required to resist sag. Therefore, our T1 has now dropped to 17,763 pounds, and our radial load dropped to well below 30,000 pounds. So in summary, we've used the program, I know I've done it very quickly, but I've used the program to show how you can do optimization comparing various belt speeds and its impact on problematic tensions. First, we sped the parameters up from what the customer orig originally requested. Hey, I want 400 feet per minute in a single drive. We said, well, we can do that for you. However, would you please consider a faster belt speed? And you see that the T2 slack side tension dropped dramatically, as I told you, and its effect on total tension was dramatic. But when we kept the speed at 600 feet per minute, per minute and went to a dual drive, the effect on, sl on uh, T2 slack side tension was enormous. So we dropped our uh, T1, our total tension from 30,500 pounds to just about 18,000 pounds. And this is an actual case where for this customer, we reduced his total tension 10,000 pounds. Now in the few minutes I have remaining, I want to show how you use the program to handle special loading conditions. You can calculate hopper feeder requirements. You can calculate uh, power required to implement uh, belt plows, a slider bed, cleated belt, or a tripper. Uh, this is beyond the scope of today's webinar, but we have two 10 minute videos available in our tutorial for you to look at, which explain to you how you would decrease active, the active volume in a hopper to 
a decreased conveyor drag. In other words, hopper drag on a feeder conveyor. So intuitively, I can tell you very quickly that the active zone in a hopper, if it had a single opening, would be large. And the active zone in a hopper would be quite small if you were to weld angle iron across the openings of the hopper. And that's the subject of our third and final demonstration of our software. So I've loaded that in for us. And you can see that I've programmed in a 20 foot long conveyor handling 500 tons per hour at 100 feet per minute. It's horizontal as most hopper feeder conveyors are. I have it fully skirted for 20 feet. I have the depth of material at three inches and I'm using the default setting of limestone just to make the point. And I have a two inch lump size, 25 degree uh, surcharge angle and so forth. So please note that with no hopper, the power required to move this material is 1.9 horsepower. We have an effective tension of 578 pounds. Now, let me demonstrate for you uh, the impact of putting on a hopper, which is 40 inches wide, it has an opening of 40 inches wide and 72 inches long, and it's a single opening. The impact on this conveyor is enormous. So notice that the hopper drag is now 9,000 pounds. So to move the same amount of material on the same conveyor at the same rate requires over 30 horsepower because we have this enormous hopper over it and, it had, and it's fully open. So once again, the hopper opening is 40 inches wide by 72 inches long. Lots of drag. Let's see if we can reduce that by simply welding in an angle iron, very inexpensive angle iron. So we're going to cut that opening from one opening into two. Each opening is now 40 inches by 36. Let's see what the impact is. We've decreased the amount of drag from 9,000 pounds to 8,100 pounds, we've decreased the horsepower from over 30 horsepower to 27 and a half. Okay, that's, that's interesting, but not very significant. Let's consider welding another angle iron in here so that we turn that one opening, not from one to two, but rather from one to four. Let's see what the impact is. Notice that we have dropped the hopper drag from 9,000 pounds to 4,500 pounds, giving us an effective tension of about 5,100 pounds and decreasing our horsepower requirement to 16.7. Let me summarize that. So I demonstrated, I realize it was very quick, but I demonstrated how you can use the special uh, condition features in our program to evaluate Hopper, uh, hopper pressure relief. And we're talking about very inexpensive steel welded across the opening of a hopper. So we kept the tonnage rate and the belt speed constant at 500 tons per hour and 100 feet per minute. One opening at 40 inches by 72 required over 30 horsepower, whereas four openings, each of which was 20 inches by 36, drops it to 16.7. A very dramatic and useful use of uh, hopper pressure. Of course, I need to add that you would never put hopper pressure relief in uh, so that the openings were so small as to, as to make plugging. Of course, you need to look at your lump size. In this case, we had a six inch lump. And so a 20 inch by 36 inch hole is no problem for the lumps to fall through. So in summary, uh, we spent some time together uh, looking at the World Mecca group, looking at the features available in our library as of today. And then I spent some considerable time defining SEMA nomenclature to, to design conveyor drives. And we looked at our program in some detail. I demonstrated a standard conveyor uh, calculation. I demonstrated how to check for dual drive applicability. And I demonstrated how to use it to uh, minimize hopper drag. And that uh, concludes this presentation. 
and I want to make sure to uh, point out to everyone that the primary reference for us was and is the Conveyor Equipment Manufacturers Association Belt Conveyors for Bulk Materials Design Manual. <clears throat> we use the fourth edition. The current edition is the seventh edition, and that uses what is now called universal methods. So I'm going to ask uh, Steve or Zach to let me know if anyone has uh, submitted any questions to us. No questions as of yet, but we're open to more. Okay, so we uh, officially have uh, 10 minutes left uh, in our hour. I see that a question is beginning to come through. I apologize that uh, we can't open the microphone to dozens of uh, participants, but definitely this um, this questions feature in your dialog box uh, allows you to communicate with us. I see that both Andrea and Francesco in Italy are attending. Thank you very much for your time today. These are the two gentlemen who are developing the improved version of the program using universal methods. Uh, while I wait for questions to come in, and I encourage you to ask anything, uh, we'll try to address it in the time we have here. Uh, please download this software and play with it. Um, make sure that you can uh, get familiar with it. And if at any time you have difficulties with it, just send us an email. We here at Romeca Corporation use it on a daily basis. And we have uh, one, two, three, four, five active users. And so uh, if you're trying to use it and you find a, a, a certain feature uh, difficult to understand, please feel free. Uh, since I'm not seeing any more questions. Hey, I'm Mike, uh, we have a question. That, um, can you elaborate on the TE, what the TE measurement represents? Yes, I certainly can. And I have a slide for that. So let me go to that slide. Uh, those letters, TE, I think Seema picked it because it was a handy way to remember that TE refers to effective tension. Don't ask me why they called it that, but effective tension is one of the two components of T1. TE, as you can see pictured here, is that amount of belt tension that is required at the drive, the drive in this example is at the head, that TE is what is required to pull the conveyor belt to overcome all of the friction, to overcome all of the momentum, and to overcome gravity. So TE is the all-important number that is required to do the work that you're asking the, the conveyor belt to do. And another slide which lets me illustrate it is right here TE is the combination of all these things. Effective tension up at the discharge, usually at the discharge where the drive is. Now, if the drive is at the tail of the pulley, at a tail pulley rather than the head pulley, then TE is going to be at the drive, which is on the return side. But ordinarily, the drive is going to be at the upper end of an elevating conveyor where the material is being discharged. And TE, as I said, uh, is the amount of tension the drive system needs to put into the belt to overcome friction, overcome gravity, and overcome momentum. And, and one thing that maybe I didn't point out very well, you don't, you, it would be nice to put that TE into the belt, but if the belt is slipping, you're not doing it. So that's why you also need to calculate T2 or slack side tension required to prevent slippage. So that you're, pull, you're tugging on the bottom side of the discharge pulley simultaneously to while you're trying to apply TE at the top strand. So let me say that one more time in summary. One more time in summary. TE is the amount of tension required to overcome friction, momentum, and gravity applied by the drive pulley. T2 
is required to keep the belt from slipping on the drive pulley and T2 is required to keep sag and usually sag occurs down here in the loading zone. This is the area of lowest tension on the belt. <coughs> so T2 needs to be high enough to prevent the, the belt from sagging in between these troughing idlers because if the belt sags between the troughing idlers, material will spill out. And once you apply T2 in this example, T2 is being applied by the use of a gravity counterweight. So let's just say our calculations told us T2 needs to be 1,000 pounds. We would make a counterweight of 2,000 pounds right here because a 2,000 pound counterweight pulling down will, re will be resisted by an equal and opposite force of 1,000 pounds in each strand of conveyor belt. And that's going to apply T2 everywhere. 100% of the belt is going to feel that T2 and that's the magic to prevent sag at the point of lowest tension and slippage at the point of drive. I hope that answered the question for the person that asked it. Hey, Mike, uh, there's another question. Um, so the question's about partially lagged drum shells and they were wondering, does it make a difference in um, the belt tension calculation? Yes, it does. And in fact, uh, your slack, in fact, this factor right here, the T2 slack side tension required to overcome, uh, to resist slippage is a, is, a, uh, is a function of whether the pulley is unlagged, fully lagged, or partially lagged. So uh, we have built parameters into the software to, for example, if you're not gonna have lagging, your slack side tension has to be higher. If you're only going to have partial lagging, your, your T2 slack side tension doesn't have to be that hard. And if you're fully lagged, your slack side tension to, re, to resist slip is the minimum of the three. I hope that was clear. Well, uh, what about, I think they're asking specifically about the partially lagged. So let's say fully lagged versus partially lagged. Does it change the tension? Yes, it, it does it. And I have a factor built in there off the top of my head. I don't remember what the factor is, uh, but we make an allowance uh, from memory. I, I, I dare not do this because it's been so long ago, but I think it's something like 50%. So the, no, it's not 50%. It's not 50%. Uh, let me, uh, let me not put a number out there for you because our part of uh, Romeca, Romeca is the only motorized pulley manufacturer who uses partial lagging. We found back in the 1980s that partial lagging was necessary so as to dissipate heat from the pulley into the belt under certain conditions, typically those of very high power and high heat dissipation requirements. So that's the purpose of partial lagging. When we lag it in a partial manner, the center third is unlagged and the outer two thirds are lagged. And so the, uh, the allowance that was put in there back in the 90s was uh, somewhere between one and zero, and I can't remember what it is. But I have to say that as we've used it all these years, it's been giving faithful and reliable results. I just don't remember what the parameter is. And if the person wants to send me an email uh, into the uh, offline, I'll look it up and I'll tell you. But the I can just tell you that it works. The last part of that is why would we use a partially lagged pulley? Uh, we use we use partial lagging because for us. Heat is the enemy. We need to dissipate heat from the internal motor into the conveyor belt. So for us, using this picture once again, no, let me not do that. Using this picture here. So that is, that is an example of a 15 horsepower motorized pulley uh, working uh, at a recycling facility, as I said earlier. 15 horsepower at that particular speed required partial lagging. So we are throwing the heat from the internal motor into the belt so that the belt is a continuous heat sink for us. So it's continuously cooling that internal motor. When you wrap a pulley shell with rubber, 
I always say it's like wrapping it with styrofoam. You're preventing heat to come out easily. The, the thermal conductivity of rubber is 20 times worse than carbon steel. So the reason for partial lagging is under those certain circumstances where we have a lot of heat to dissipate, we have uh, pure contact between the surface of the pulley and the bottom of the conveyor belt to continuously cool the internal motor. And if anybody's curious, I can tell you that these shells, we make the shells ourselves from plate, we roll plate, and the thickness of the shell in the center line is over one inch thick. We actually cut away material from the outer two thirds to put in the lagging. Uh, Steve, I noticed that our time is up. Uh, do we have any more questions at this point? Uh, one last quick check, but I don't think so. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for uh, attending today. I hope that you found this time useful. Uh, we are going to be posting a recording of this webinar on our website and feel free to look at it um, at your leisure. Uh, if any of you have follow up questions on anything that was said, please feel free to send us an email and we will be delighted to respond. I want to thank you all for attending and bid you a good day. Uh, keep your eyes open for future uh, newsletter uh, announcements of future webinars. And by the way, if you have a suggestion on anything you would like to hear us speak about, please send it in and we'll give it due consideration. Thank you and goodbye.